What in the world are you supposed to do with jury selection? How in the world do you get a handle on the complex set of skills that are important for talking and selecting jurors that will be right for the State versus Mitchell case? Well, let me give you some tips and some suggestions about ways to think about what it is that you're doing. And so let me talk about, first of all, the purpose of jury selection and talk to you about some theories that are out there about that and then give you some specific skills that I hope you'll see integrate these different purposes into a set of tasks that you have to perform as you do the, the jury selection exercise. Jury selection, of course, is called voir dire, jury voir dire. Voir dire is to speak the truth. And the idea is, is that jurors are supposed to be sworn to tell you the truth for the purpose of your trying to figure out whether they'll be fair jurors for the case. And so we'll talk in just a minute about how it is that you get started and how it is that you describe what it is that you're doing. But one way to think about your task is to say, how do I make sure that I've got jurors out there that don't have experiences, experiences in their lives that are going to make it very difficult for uh, them to be able to hear the case that I'm presenting and to be able to hear the fairness, the fair thing to do because of biases or prejudices or experiences that they may have. Now, you know, in the old days, uh, one of the ways that lawyers dealt with jurors and jury selection is, is that because they were so closely connected to the communities in which they worked, they would often have lunch with these jurors. They knew where they went to church. They knew where it is that they lived. They knew what organizations they belonged to. They knew how they thought about the world because literally the trial lawyers, part of the trial lawyers of expertise was to know the members of the community, know how it is that the community was reacting to various things. It was a small enough community that selecting jurors was an art based upon the expertise of a lawyer who knew the community and knew it very, very well. And the task for us as modern trial lawyers is much more difficult. Number one, we're getting into court much, many fewer times. But number two, our connection to our jurors, our closeness to our jurors, our knowledge of our jurors is much more difficult for us to be able to get into because our communities often are very much apart from each other. And so, you know, one question that we could ask is, as opposed to joining the, the country club and playing golf, should you be joining the bowling league or should you be hanging out in places where your jurors are likely to come from for the purposes of really understanding how these jurors are going to see the world and to think? In the size of the communities that so many of us deal with, even then, Knowing what these jurors think and how they think and how they feel and how they look at the world is a very uncertain process. Even if you hang out with them and even if you get to know the folks from the pool of jurors that your, your jurors are drawn from. So the purpose of the jury selection process is in this impersonal world, how do you get to know about people's values? And how do you get to know about their experiences? Well, some have said that really you're not looking for fair jurors. What you're doing instead is basically you're looking for jurors who are for you, who already have experiences. You decide what those experiences would be that would make them predisposed to be for you. And a classic quick anecdote might make the point. You know, Dr. Kevorkian, Dr. Death a number of years ago up in Michigan was was tried on nine different occasions for attempted murder, for murder, for euthanasia, for a mercy killing is what he's, that he called it. And what we have is then a laboratory to try to look at what jurors are going to be sympathetic to a doctor who is not shy about the fact that he is helping somebody end their lives by administering some kind of a painkiller which has an effect of ending their life because they choose to do it. And the story is told that in early on in these cases, in a focus group setting, one of the focus group members raised her hand early and said, you know, when I hear about Dr. Kevorkian, I keep thinking about an old dog. And this old dog was a dog that was suffering and, you know, we put it to sleep. And the question, it seems to me, we have to ask ourselves is, if we do this for animals, 
and we think it's humane for animals, isn't it also fair to ask the question of whether or not it's something that we do for human beings when they're suffering? Well, you might imagine that that story being told affected the trial lawyers for Dr. Kevorkian. And you know that in the first eight cases, in the cases that he was not found guilty, the first question or one of the first questions in jury selection, as reported by David Ball, one of the jury consultants in these cases, was a question to the jurors, have any of you had an animal, a dog that you've ever had to put to sleep? And by drawing on that common experience, the argument is, is that that experience could predispose now jurors in hearing about a case to think that, you know, Dr. Kevorkian should not be guilty of murder for what it is that he's doing. So in that theory, that approach is to try to find that experience. Where would you find those experiences? Well, boy, this is a place where you've got to really brainstorm. You've got to think about cre uh, creatively about focus groups and trying to find out whether there are formative experiences. Presumably, we know from the O.J. Simpson cases that there are experiences that people have that could make them very much against you. Remember, in the O.J. Simpson case, the theory was is that the police officers were in a rush to judgment, that they were racist, and that they planted evidence. Well, if your experience in the Los Angeles community was that police officers did plant evidence, did lie, did convict individuals or help convict individuals because of their racial bias, then you can see that in that instance now, you're not looking for jurors who are for you, you're looking for jurors who are against you. And you're trying to find out if you were on the prosecution's team, what jurors have those kinds of experiences? How do you feel about police officers? What's your experience been with police officers? And your jury selection would try to find out those experiences and try to find ways to exclude jurors if they had those experiences. Now, so theories are often directed at these three things, finding fair jurors, finding jurors for you, finding jurors against you. And you need to know that a whole lot of courts have decided that because the time it would take really to find out about these experiences is time the court's not willing to give, that the court either takes over the purpose of voir dire by telling the jury we're looking for you to be fair and you tell us if you don't think you can be fair. We don't have the time unless we've got some pre-trial work done that's made a presentation to the court that shows there are particular kinds of experiences that need to be watched out for that's going to create an unfair bias. That what we're left with, if a court gives voir dire, it's often giving voir dire on a very limited basis and trial lawyers today feel like that most of their time then needs to be spent protecting themselves from experiences jurors may have biases that they may have, prejudices that they may have, that would predispose the jury against them and against their case. And so race is a topic of conversation. Race is important for the purposes of trying to determine whether or not individuals are biased and whether or not, in fact, they have prejudices against people of particular races. Um, being from, not from this community, being an outsider, being somebody who has a uh, uh, education or, a, or a, um, a situation where they are predisposed against folks who have those kinds of qualifications, either for or against, is something that trial lawyers today tell us that they spend their time when they're given that limited opportunity. Now, for our purposes of discussion, we're going to assume a wide open voir dire. And for our purposes of discussion, we're going to assume that you are in a situation where you have a huge panel of folks and you're going to try to bring them into the box and you're going to try to create an environment where they're going to talk to you and they're going to share with you how they feel about the world, about the values that they have that help them either see this case one way or another. And we're going to allow you to go ahead and have conversations with jurors to do that. If you're restricted in that regard and you want to have that access, you're going to have to petition the court Without that kind of uh, uh, permission granted, often courts will take over the process themselves. Maybe at the most they'll let you submit individual questions, but you may find that most courts today have restricted your jury selection down, way down. 
We're going to do it in a broad way because we want to give you an experience of what it would be like to voir dire in a situation where it's wide open and you get a chance to really explore the interests and biases and experiences that jurors may have. Well, what if you found a bias? What if you found a, a concern that would make you worry that the person might be against you? You need to know about two things. You need to know about peremptory challenges. In every jurisdiction, you're given a certain number of peremptory challenges. The peremptory challenges are often somewhere in the neighborhood of 6 to 10, and they'll give you a chance to go ahead and excuse jurors for the purpose of saying that, well, I just don't feel good about this person. And uh, I would rather not have my client have to deal with that person. They're just not feeling right to me. Your peremptory challenges are on your choice, based upon feelings that you get. Often those can be informed by a psychologist who can be sitting, watching as this thing goes on. Or they can be informed by an associate who's taking notes as you're having conversations. You'll see that one of the most difficult things that happens as a skill of, of jury selection is how do you keep track of what answers you're getting from what people and then how do you make a good reason judgment about whether you ought to exercise a peremptory challenge or not. Now the other kind of challenge is a challenge for cause. The challenge for cause is brought about when the jurors in a sense admit that it'd be very difficult for them to be fair. And we'll talk about the different skills that you're looking when you want your opponent to at least exercise a peremptory challenge. And we'll talk about the skills of questioning that are involved when you're trying to lead a juror to a position where you would rather that they, in fact, uh, admit that they would not be fair in a case. So the purpose of jury selection is fair jurors, but when time is short, at least to try to get rid of jurors that are predisposed against you. And you're doing that by having conversations with folks that would allow you to exercise a, a educated judgment to exercise a peremptory challenge, force each side to use up their peremptory challenges so that in fact they're left with jurors that presumably after that each side has exercised their peremptories to a balanced jury and also to make sure that if you can you don't want to waste your peremptory challenges you have an unlimited number of challenges for cause based upon a jurors admitting what it is that's going on. All right, now let's talk about the skills. Now the first thing is, is really, is getting started. Now here again, the judge will have done a fair amount of the work in the typical setting. The judge will have asked the jurors whether or not they know any of the parties. They'll have asked whether they know any of the lawyers in the case, whether they'll know any of the important witnesses that are going to testify, or any of the witnesses at all. And so there will be this, do you know any of these parties? Presumably, if you know these individuals, they could be a reason to keep you off. After that, the judge often will let counsel, if they've given them permission to go ahead and address the jury, to go ahead and stand around and address the jury. And what you'll have to see is, is that how the judge sets up the voir dire often can vary. Sometimes what you have is you have a courtroom that has about 40 jurors in it. You seat 12, you talk to the 12. As folks get excused, then other people come and they fill their places until the peremptories have been used up and everybody is satisfied. Or, in addition, what you can have is, is you can have a situation where everybody is sitting in one place and you're having a conversation to the group, to the large group as a whole and you're trying to include prospective folks into the conversation um, uh, one at a time. Sometimes the way it works is you have a voir dire on an individual juror and you satisfy each side about that and then you move on to the next one. That, that one, that, that technique is a very, very labor process and there's a whole lot of concern about whether everybody else is bored by your individual conversations with the, with, uh, the jurors and therefore often that is not a technique that you see too much but you could have an individual jury voir dire, voir dire uh, person by person. When you stand then, if you assume the usual process, which is that you have a group of folks sitting in the box and then a group of people who are sitting out in the audience and you're going to ask questions to them, you should explain what jury voir dire is and tell them in a sense, this is the time to talk to you to find out whether or not you're the right jurors for this case. 
Now, it's important for them not to see that you're casting moral judgment on them if you excuse them. It's just that, and you could give them examples about this, that in fact, if you've just been through a divorce, maybe you're not the right person to sit on a divorce case. That if you've just lost a loved one, then maybe you're not in a position to be the best person in a wrongful death case. If you've just had a problem with a police officer and a false arrest, then you probably wouldn't be the right person to sit in a case where the police's judgment in arresting is a person is um, at issue. And so the description of and giving examples of the kinds of experiences jurors may have in a kind of a generic case is a way that often that, that lawyers will start, get started with the voir dire. And you're trying to establish good eye contact with the people in the voir dire. You're supposed to, you should, you should take a pace that's open and friendly, that's conversational. And what you're trying to do is to say to them, we're looking for fairness. We want you to, in a sense, put yourself into the shoes of my client and ask yourself, this is, the, this is the overall purpose, could I be fair to him or am I predisposed, based on who I am, to really not be fair to that individual based upon their characteristics. And that's where you're headed in this and your opening conversation then describes what jury selection is. Now, one of the things that's interesting about jury selection is, is that you want people to open up. And obviously the best way to get them to open up is to ask them open-ended questions. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your job. Describe to me where you work. Tell me what it is that you do day to day. Open-ended questions with jurors are ways to get them to talk. The problem is, is that as you're getting them comfortable and having a conversation with them, one of the things that you've got to be careful about is, is that everybody gets included fairly quickly. Otherwise, what will happen is, is that there is a potential for boredom to set in or people feel excluded. You're very interested in having this conversation with this one juror and you're less interested in them and they feel slighted. And so very quickly what you want to do is by asking open-ended questions is to engage the group in a, in a whole. Now where time is limited, after you do some beginning kinds of tell me about yourself questions, if the court gives you that, then you want to move very quickly into kinds of questions which are trying to get at those experiences again that may occur to jurors that would make them predisposed against you. Now do you see the dilemma here? The dilemma is, is that if you ask a question like, have you ever had an experience with a police officer or somebody you know had an experience with a police officer or you believe the police officer was not playing fair? If you ask a question like that, then the potential is, is that the rest of the jury vernier gets polluted by the answer that is given. That the argument that is, uh, be careful the pollution argument is, is to be careful about the kinds of questions that you're asking and the amount of discussion that you're getting from the jurors because in fact it may affect the rest of the jurors to see the case that way. Now, you're going to hear different advice about this. Frankly, I think that the advice of pollution against pollution is overstated. It does seem to me that all the jurors as they listen to it, if you, what you do is you develop that experience, the person is asked questions about, it sounds to me like that experience is very fresh to you, that it'd be very difficult to put that experience aside. You agree with me that it would be difficult for you to, to tr judge this case based on the facts presented in the case without importing in your own experience into the setting. That in that situation, that if the person agrees with you about that and they're excused for cause, that there's an education that occurs to the jurors that overrides the pollution, the potential pollution effect. On the other hand, there are of course situations where if a person is describing spouse abuse or if a person is describing a very tragic situation where there will be sympathy and of course exercise your judgment as to whether or not in fact you might want to talk about it in private one of the things you should know is that you can choose, if you see that the juror is having difficulty, to say, would you like to talk about this in private? And to invite that as a way of understanding more about the experience, perhaps making a judgment about challenge for cause without having this overall pollution effect on the jurors. My view, 
for what it's worth is, is that better to find out about that experience, to find out how deeply it's held, and not worry so much about the effect on the rest, if what you can do is to show by your questioning that in fact it's not fair for that person to be sitting on the juror. Then the educational effect presumably overwhelms the, the, um, the pollution effect that might otherwise occur. And again, for what it's worth also, my, my view is that if you can get people to talk about race issues and prejudice issues, that in fact the education effect of getting people to recognize that it's difficult for them to be fair with those kinds of attitudes and views will teach the rest of the jurors as to how it is that they should behave and that the, the pollution effect is overblown. Better to find out about it as opposed to not find out about it. Now, how do you find out about questions of race? Obviously, talking about attitudes towards busing, about where kids, their kids go to school, um, can give you some feel, some general feel. When you have a race issue, when you have a defendant that you're, you're uh, representing that is uh, a minority member of, the, of a community and you want and worry about the race issues, one of the things to do is to really get some consultation and some help. You want to find out how do people feel. You want to find out what kinds of questions will give the most socially acceptable way into people talking about their attitudes and their perceptions. And that is something that involves good expertise of people that are out there that will help you with that. But part of what you're doing is asking them to describe their experiences, to go deep, to tell you more about those experiences, and then make a judgment about whether or not you want to take it to a challenge to cause or whether you want to stop the conversation and at least take them into a peremptory challenge and have them excused. So you have group conversations. You're, you're asking open-ended questions, you're following up to try to get more information and more detail. Once you get enough information, what you're wanting to do is to make the decision about whether or not you're going to take them to a peremptory challenge. Your, um, your view about peremptory challenges, when you want the opponent to waste one, you've heard an experience that the person has that's predisposed for you, one of the things that you can do is to lead in a way that rehabilitates that juror. And the way that you lead to rehabilitate the jury is to say, despite that experience, I'm sure you could still put that aside and try this case based upon the evidence that's presented in this case. Am I right? You could still be fair, don't you think, based upon hearing all the evidence in the case. And that technique, a leading question that leads them to a fairness position, will force your opponent to use a peremptory. Judges often jump in in order to be able to rehabilitate a juror if the judge is in the room because they want to move it along and they want you to exercise your peremptory so that you're, you're back into a position where you're, you're stuck with the jurors that are there. But you can use those same techniques when you try to put on the other side um, the uh, option for, for uh, exercising a peremptory challenge. If you want to lead somebody to a challenge for cause, similarly, your open-ended questions will change and we'll move into a leading question format. So having had that experience of, of having a, a sister who's been abused as a spouse and you saw the tragedy that she went through and uh, I take it that that's an experience that still is fresh. It's one that still makes you angry. You still probably have some strong feelings, don't you, about um, the situation that your sister was forced to suffer through. And I would imagine it would be hard to put those aside. And, uh, judging this case and deciding whether or not in fact there was a, abuse that was going on in this case. And if you get yeses to those leading questions then you're in a position to exercise a challenge for cause to ask the juror to be excused. Now there's a whole technique about when do you exercise the challenges for cause, do you exercise them immediately, do you save them up within the group and the panel, you need to ask the judge and the court as to how they're dealing with the questions of when do you exercise your peremptory challenges and when you exercise your challenges for cause. You can see that what this does is it creates a record-keeping nightmare for a single trial lawyer. 
to have in front of you a group of people you're trying to keep their answers straight, you're trying to remember who, what their names are, if, if you get to know their names or you're just referring to them by jurors one, two, three, and four and then that changes. You've got occupations, you've got information about their likes and dislikes and keeping that track, track of that is a record keeping nightmare. You want to make sure you have note taking materials in front of you with the box with jurors as they go in for you to be able to take notes and scratch out if people are excused in order to be able to keep track of what's going on or to ask an associate to help you in that record keeping. Often lawyers today when the cases um, are um, significant enough that it, that, and the resources are there to go ahead and do it, you may have people in the room, psychologists who are you're consulting with to help you make the decisions. So the skills of jury selection are, frankly, making an opening presentation about what jury selection is. Number two, its ability to ask open-ended questions, both of individuals, but to the group as a whole, that as you get information about your jurors that you want to follow up, to go deep, to get more detail, to find out more about those experiences. And then similarly then, to make a decision about peremptories or challenges for cause or whether or not you believe the person is fair and whether or not you've got enough to feel confident that they're at least in the midway point with you and move on. One last word. Where do you get the information? Where do you get the topics to ask the jurors about your case to find out the experiences they may have. Well, this is, there's nothing, no substitute for you're looking at your case from the perspective of people in the community and thinking what experiences might they have that could make them predisposed against my client. So issues of race, differences in class, experiences that people may have had that have, that have strong emotional appeal could predispose them one way or the other. Uh, differences in gender, education level, differences in ways that people see the world, people who are in basically a belief that they control their environment and in fact things then that happen are somebody else's fault if they're controlling their environment or people who really think that life is not very easily controlled. You will find that your consultants say there are basically two types of people in the world, and you've heard about this before, A types and B types, and the A types that are control freaks, they're the ones that you want if you're the prosecution, and they're the ones that you want if you're the defendant, because obviously then it's somebody else's fault if something bad happens, and you can control yourself. If, if you can control your environment, then it's likely that the plaintiff is contributorily negligent. And then there are the B types, who worry much more that life happens to them and, and they're more uh, the kind of the stereotype, stereotypical bleeding heart liberals who are um, overly sympathetic to the sad story of an individual uh, and what it is that's happened to them. There are all kinds of theories and all kinds of stereotypes and you want to canvas broadly asking yourself basically what are those experiences and what is the profile of the juror who would be predisposed against me or what kinds of experiences may be in play that could predispose a juror for me, especially if we've got the resources to sort that out. And having an analysis of those key topics that you want to talk about, the te techniques are group interviewing. So some ideas about skills, public presentation, open-ended questions, follow-ups, and then leading questions to exercise challenges for cause and peremptory challenges.